So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, fifth session on, on multi-phase. Uh, my name is Miguel Nobrega. I'm from the University of Minho in Portugal, and I'll be sharing the session. We have uh, scheduled four presentations, uh, and uh, we'll start the first. The first presentation is from the University of Minho. Uh, Omed Reza Ali that will talk about uh, the effect of elasticity on the on the flow uh, in in profile exclusion dyes. So, Mohamed, please you can start whenever you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miguel, uh, for your nice presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohamed Reza Ali. I am a PhD student at University of Minho in Portugal. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the effect of the fluid elasticity on pressure drop and uh, fluid distribution in profile extrusion, which was part of my PhD uh, project under supervision of the Professor, uh, of Carne uh, Professor Olga Carneiro and Professor Miguel Nobrega. Uh, let me just uh, turn on my pointer so it would be good. Okay, the outlines of the, uh, this presentation uh, are first introduction and objective, second is case study, uh, we go to the results and discussion, and at the end we conclude, uh, we have a conclusion. Let's start with the introduction section. Nowadays, polymeric material-based products have a significant ef effect in uh, several, uh, several fields such as health, mobility, uh, civil constructions, uh, energy packing, and etc. Therefore, a huge studies uh, have been carried out in this area. The extrusion process, particularly profile extrusion, is one of the available process techniques among the several other techniques, uh, which is used in the pro uh, production of the wide range of the poly uh, polymer-based products. As you can see in the uh, video here, Exclusion is a steady state uh, process that transfers a polymer raw material into the uh, constant cross section products. A typical profile extrusion line consists of, uh, consists of uh, uh, an extrusion, uh, an, ex uh, an extruder, which is responsible to melt, uh, melt the solid material, uh, homogenize and push the molten polymer towards the extrusion die. Uh, an extrusion die which is responsible to shape the molten polymer into the desired cross section. Uh, and uh, we have a calibration cooling system which is responsible to cool and size the molten polymer in order to guarantee the final uh, required shape of the, for the polymer and a caterpillar half of unit which just uh, pulling, the, uh, pulling the profile in the certain, uh, in the certain linear velocity and uh, at the end, we have a cutting unit which cuts the cuts the profile into the over desired lengths. The design of the extrusion uh, die should be should comprise the solution of the two main challenges. Uh, main challenges. First is the flow balance as uh, flow balance, and the second is the extrudate swap. Uh, concerning flow balance, we should uh, we should ensure to reach uh, uh, um, somehow the same flow rates in every everywhere in the flow channel. As you can see in the left uh, left profile, we never reach to the this uh, this goal, uh, and we have an unbalanced flow. As you can see, we have a different colors in the different section of the profile, which are representative of the different flow rates. But at the right hand side, we have a somehow partially balanced flow, which uh, we can see that uh, almost everywhere light green colors and just some uh, red spots. Uh, they are located on the intersection of the profile, which are the problematic section of the each profile. And at the right hand side, we have the extruded swell, which is another main challenge of the profile extrusion die design. As, uh, and each, uh, as you can see in the right hand side, we have a Newtonian fluid uh, in the movie, and uh, we don't have any swelling behavior after syringe exit. But for the right, uh, for the left hand side, which, uh, which we have blue uh, fluids, 
we have uh, swelling behavior immediately after the syringe exits. Uh, and this behavior is uh, motivated by the viscoelastic nature of the polymeric melts. And even would be, uh, would be uh, very problematic when we are using Hall of System and it can be disordered. So uh, these two challenges always should be uh, taken into the account when we are designing the profile, uh, profile, di uh, profile dyes. For the, for the exclusion. In the past, experimental trials and error approach uh, was the most common and only approach to deal uh, with, the, you know, with the mention uh, challenges, uh, which was a, a highly uh, resource demanding approach. But uh, however, nowadays due to the improving the computational approaches and in another hand, growing the complexity of the uh, geometries of the profiles and the request for the shorter times to market, computer either design methodologies are most employed either using uh, commercial uh, or open source softwares. Our objective was uh, investigate the effect of the fluid models, uh, particularly elastic and inelastic, on the accuracy of the numerical production of, uh, prediction of the confined flows, including flow distribution and total pressure, uh, pressure drop. Okay, let's go to the case study. I would mention here all the experimental uh, were carried out in our department, polymer engineering department of the University of Mino, which uh, we are capable to do wide range of the neurological uh, characterization. And uh, the material which we use for this uh, work uh, was an extrusion grade of the polycarbonate used by our uh, by our partner company Suprefa, uh, extrusion company Suprefa, to produce a swimming uh, swimming uh, pool cover profile. Uh, as you can see here in the, this figure, we just made a me uh, dynamic mechanical analysis in different temperatures, then we uh, shifted uh, to the reference temperature, the experimental data, then we used the multi-mode get uh, Maxwell model to fit the, our experimental data and uh, determine the required, uh, required uh, parameters listed in this uh, uh, table, which are later used in our numerical modeling. Then, uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to determine nonlinear behavior of the material, we perform the uniaxial extensional uh, rheometry test in the different extensional rates, as uh, as presented in this figure. And then we use the multi-mode viscous model uh, to fit our experimental data and uh, perf uh, and determine the mobility factor. Again, these data we use in uh, our numerical modeling. Each of them is using for for the inelastic case modeling or elastic case modeling. Okay, uh, to allow a pro, uh, to allow a, pro, uh, a proper model comparison, a methodology, a methodology is uh, proposed for uh, for the generating the parameters of the inelastic constitutive kind of models based on a viscoelastic counterparts. Uh, as you can see in the uh, in the in the figure, we have uh, green uh, green uh, circles and red circles uh, circles. Red silk, the circles are uh, generated by the our in-house code and based on the based on the viscoelastic uh, parameters, and the uh, green ones are the are the experimental uh, ones. And uh, as the, the as you can see in graph, we have a very good agreement between the uh, numerically generated data and the experimental ones. Then we use the uh, bird carrier model, as expressed here, uh, in to feed the over. Uh, our data and uh, our data and uh, determine the required the required parameters. Okay, for this uh, for this work we use two different geometries. Uh, one is a simple geometry, which is a rectangle geometry, as uh, shown in this figure. Uh, we just use a quarter of the a quarter of the geometry in order to speed up our calculation and. Uh, and uh, we we had uh, we had the mesh sensitivity analysis. Uh, finally, we reached to the this uh, mesh here with this number of the cells. Then we divided over uh, the outlet of the uh, outlet of the domain to different elemental section in order to investigate the uh, effect of the flow rates or an average. Uh, outlet velocity in each section and uh, also we use <coughs> sorry also we use different 
different conditions in order to have an insist investigation uh, regarding average velocity and convergence angle. Uh, convergence angle. Then we have a complex geometry, which is the uh, which is the geometry is which is the type used by <coughs> our uh, our uh, partner company, so prefer to uh, generating the, generating the swimming pool covers, and uh, <coughs> we mainly did. The, Refinement, uh, mesh refinement in near to the outlet in, because the higher gradient always happen in this area. And uh, we did the same, we divided the outlet for the different elemental sections and the number of the mesh is uh, roughly 30 million. We use the CF mesh to, um, to generate the mesh uh, for both geometries. Okay, let's start with the results and discussion. As can be seen in the uh, in this figure, we uh, uh, in terms of the velocity profile, we did uh, not see any big difference between the elastic and inelastic uh, data. But in terms of the pressure drop, we have a remarkable difference between the elastic and inelastic uh, model. And in order to uh, investigate more. We just grab a point as uh, as indicated here, P1, and uh, then we uh, plot the pressure drop uh, for the different case studies. As uh, clearly seen in this uh, graph, uh, we always have a lower pressure uh, pressure drop for the elastic terms of elastic case and higher for inelastic one. And these uh, these differences increasing when we are increasing the average outlet velocity, as you can see in this green. Uh, Curves and decrease when we are decreasing of our, uh, our average outlet velocity, but it is not uh, changed by using the different uh, convergence angle. In order to uh, have the insist investigation for this problem, we just uh, plot the plot the velocity profile in different location of the parallel zone. Uh, a, B, and C, and the uh, 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 shear and normal stresses. There isn't any uh, big difference between the between the elastic and inelastic in terms of the uh, profile, velocity profile. But uh, as expected, we have a zero shear, uh, zero normal stresses for inelastic and non-zero value for the uh, elastic case. Uh, but we have a different between the elastic and inelastic. Uh, case uh, for uh, in terms of the shear stresses. In order to understand, uh, we, uh, we had uh, several hypotheses for this case, and uh, the one was uh, close to the real uh, reality problem was uh, non, uh, non fully developed uh, flow condition promoted by uh, the uh, lack of sufficient uh, sufficient length of the parallel zone. In order to confirm this hypothesis, a, a new 2D uh, simple geometry, uh, simple geometry with a very long, uh, very long parallel zones was set up, and uh, we replicate the, our investigation for these cases. Uh, these, uh, as you can see, for this uh, graph, we uh, uh, like this uh, 3D simple geometry. We could not see any uh, big difference uh, between elastic and inelastic case in terms of the uh, pro uh, velocity profile. But uh, in terms of the stresses, we have a difference and we have un, uh, unsta unstability. But uh, it is uh, most uh, can be seen in, uh, in the normal stresses uh, up to the certain, certain lengths of the parallel zone, I would say 100 millimeters. Uh, the, the stress uh, is still evolving. And uh, beyond 100, uh, 100 millimeters, we reach to the steady state uh, condition, which means that we have a fully developed uh, flu condition after uh, 100 millimeter in the in the parallel zone. That can be the that can be clearly confirmed uh, with these two graphs, which are the pressure drop and pressure gradients, as can be seen. F, uh, beyond 120 millimeters, 120 millimeters in the parallel zone, we, uh, we reach to the stable uh, behavior of the uh, pressure gradient. And uh, the small difference is visible for the elastic and in, between elastic and inelastic case, which can be promoted by uh, different, uh, different constitutive models employed or uh, different solver used. Okay, with these uh, with these uh, results, we have confirmed uh, in order to have uh, in order to have the same pressure drop and the same uh, condition for elastic and inelastic case, we should use uh, very 
uh, very long parallel zones uh, sufficient enough to reach the fully developed condition. And here we conclude our hypothesis was correct. Then we just uh, compared the uh, different conditions in order to have uh, a better investigation. For instance, at the left-hand side, we just compared the different average velocity uh, results. As you can see, uh, for the lower average velocity, we don't have uh, any big difference between elastic and inelastic, but by increasing the uh, uh, out, average output velocity, the difference increasing, especially for the elastic case. But again, uh, the convergence and the uh, convergence angle uh, located in the in the geometry did not affect uh, significantly over our uh, our results. So we shift to the all complex geometry as. As you can see in the, in the left hand side, we have some red spot for the elastic uh, on the elastic uh, out, uh, outlet uh, outlet, and uh, for the inelastic uh, case, uh, I would say that uh, the the, the fluid is uh, somehow uh, balanced. And uh, here I should note that this, uh, this geometry uh, previously was, uh, was optimized by using an inelastic, uh, inelastic constitutive models. And this is clearly can be seen in, the, in this graph, which we have a different, uh, different velocity in different uh, elemental section of uh, elemental section at outlets, okay? But even for this optimal uh, optimized uh, guide, we have a different behavior at the, at the uh, complex part of the geometry. When we are using elastic, uh, elastic model, this can be this promoted by elasticity behavior of the uh, behavior of the material and emphasize on using the uh, on using realistic and uh, viscoelastic model to uh, modeling and predicting the behavior of the uh, molten polymers. In terms of the complex uh, complex geometry, in terms of the pressure drop, uh, we see exactly the same as we saw for the uh, for the complex for the simple geometry. In the left hand side, we have uh, uh, we have elastic case, which we have a lower pressure drop, and the right hand side we have uh, in elastic uh, case study with higher pressure drop. And uh, I would say this one, we, uh, again, we use the uh, typical uh, ratio, uh, ratio for, the, for the parallel zone, the length of the parallel zones, which is typical in the industry. It's around uh, thickness over length, so it should be 10. Uh, length uh, over thickness should be 10. Uh, and we uh, confirm we should have a uh, uh, longer parallel zone in order to have uh, uh, in order to have the same pressure drop uh, in both elastic and inelastic case and reaching to the fully developed uh, flow condition for the elastic case. Okay, in terms of the conclusion, uh, I would say flow distribution difference increase with the uh, flow rates, in particular for the elastic fluids. Convergence angle did not significantly affect the uh, flow distribution. Flow, uh, velocity profile evaluate uh, quickly along the parallel zone, both for elastic and inelastic case. In terms of the pressure drop, we saw the systematic difference between the elastic and inelastic fluids was uh, found in both simple and uh, complex geometry, uh, which um, which uh, uh, need of the longer parallel zone is required to achieve a fully developed flow uh, pressure gradient in both simple and complex geometries. And in terms of the design stage, we uh, obviously we, uh, we can have a uh, remarkably shorter, uh, shorter uh, design stage when we are using an inelastic constitutive kind of models, but uh, fever correction would be expected on the experimental trials and error for the elastic model, since uh, the elastic models are the realistic one and they are more accurate. And uh, we need to use uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of the constitutive kind of models. Uh, so uh, for, the, for more detail, you can, uh, you can just scan this QR Code to have the detail, detailed information about uh, this work, which is uh, published in the uh, PS Journal. And uh, I would finish my presentation here. Thanks for your time. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mohamed, for the nice presentation. So we have time for questions. Who wants to ask something to Mohamed? Okay, it seems okay. Maybe I'll do it. I'll take. I'll do it in advance. <laughs> Maybe one of these days. So, uh, Mohamed, uh, from from the conclusions you you got from from the, uh, this study, what would you advise to a dye designer in the future to 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 operate or how you should do to properly design extrusion dyes? Which which should be your advice? I would, uh, if they're they're uh, considering the time uh, and uh, uh, they want to have a shorter design, uh, they would use the inelastic capacity uh, models. But for my uh, for my opinion, they should always use the viscoelastic models because when we are using inelastic uh, models, we are just neglecting most important uh, feature of the viscoelastic uh, uh, materials which cause viscoelasticity. And we, uh, we clearly saw this behavior for the optimized uh, complex tie, which we are using the viscoelastic, uh, viscoelastic model. And I would say here, uh, moreover, when the, that die uh, was optimized by using an inelastic uh, model, uh, a lot of trials and experimental trials and error uh, have been carried out in the company as reported by our partner company, Soprefa, uh, which, uh, which means that uh, in elastic model, uh, also it's, uh, it has a shorter design stage, but it's not good to, uh, to, design, uh, to design, to use for designing the profile extrusion dyes when we are using the molten polymer, which is the representative of the viscoelastic models. Okay, okay. Thank you. It's uh, uh, on the other side, the calculation times for viscoelastic models is quite high. Yeah, uh, it's true. Uh, so, so it's uh, may, maybe considering a mixed approach, starting by an elastic, adjusting the geometry, and then do the last calculations uh, with viscoelastic maybe viscoelastic model. Uh, yeah that can be also the uh, another alternative uh, alternative manner to do uh, yeah it's true because when we are using an elastic model we are just neglecting most part of the uh, reality and for that reason we have very uh, i would say weak uh, weak expression to solve and that caused to shorter uh, the calculation time but for the viscoelastic uh, models we have a complex uh, complex uh, complex uh, expression and complex behavior uh, which should uh, should uh, should calculate it. Okay. So thank you very much. I don't know if there are any other questions. So if not, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, uh, my, my, my name is Suraj and I'm going to talk about the application of uh, intertract foam in the context uh, in the context of studying oscillatory dynamics and capillary rise. Uh, this is specifically with intertrack foam, and I would like to acknowledge uh, our collaborators in this project, Professor Joel Dekonik, and also Professor Tukovic, the original author of intertrack foam, and also um, also the bachelor's student involved in this. Uh, yeah, so the outline is uh, first we review the inter interface tracking in open foam, the intertrack foam, and mainly the important features of it in the context of betting. And then we review the regime transition in capillary rise, the classical, the classical problem, we introduce it. And then we have uh, advanced ODE modeling uh, with slip and dynamic contact angle. And in the outlook, where we are going with these two ODE models from here. And yeah, so uh, beginning, with us, beginning with a very cl classical two-phase Navier-Stokes equations, uh, uh, which under which underlie the which underlie the multiphase flows. Uh, we have we have also the kinematic condition and the dynamic condition. The it's called the uh, transmission conditions, and also we have uh, we have the Navier slip boundary condition with this, which is a, which is one way of regularizing the motion of the contact line. And we also have the uh, interface velocity equations for interface interface velocities and contact line velocities. 
and also uh, a model for contact angle which depends on the capillary number or the interface velocity and this is a pretty classical framework and this is discretized uh, within the within the early context and outlined in the work of professor tukovic uh, in 2012 and also from my predecessor uh, dev grunding in his phd thesis and so the coming to the important features of intertrack foam in the context of wetting i would say it's the finite area method which is uh, which which enables us to have a surface mesh on the interface of uh, droplets for example or bubbles and and this mesh this mesh a finite area mesh which is analogous to a finite volume mesh in the bulk uh, uh, with this we can solve some pdes on the interface or or the or the surface of the drops or anything and because we have a mesh that is analogous to a finite volume mesh we this enables us to have accurate curvature computation and i would like to point out this specific uh, specific equation here for normal curvature computation which is completely depending on the on the mesh point normals here and and also from the fact that we have a total surface tension force on this closed surface here to be equal to zero and and it can be expressed as a summation of the surface tension along the direction of the binormal vectors and 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 multiplied with the edge edge uh, edges of the closed surface here so this is the normal component of this uh, surface tension force expressed as this summation and and we have the calculation of the interface normals also here uh, with, the, with the help of the binormal vectors here so so here i point this out because this curvature computation is not depending on any laplacian term like we have in for example the volume of fluid method or the or 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 level sets and we don't have the problems which come from there and yeah so uh, continuing with this we i want to point out also the control point algorithm in the context of contact line motion uh, where we have some uh, net volume net uh, mass flux which is supposed to be zero but it is not at the end of the at the end of the say uh, non orthogonal correct correction or the outer correction and we have this mass flux uh, from which we compute a uh, volume to be swept uh, to to ensure that the mass flux on the discretized interface spaces are zero and we compute this uh, volume to be swept and divide by the area of this interface spaces and we get the distance to which uh, distance to which the point has to be moved and we have additional uh, additional mesh motion uh, helper called the control points here which lie on top of the interface faces and and these also um, help to create a least square plane upon which these control points move and then the inter actual interface points move on to the least square plane and this is how uh, this is basically how the control point moves in the context of uh, in the context of with or without contact line but with contact lines we also have this additional mirror control points or ghost control points here which help to move uh the actual contact line point onto the least square plane here and and also this movement of the interface mesh at at every at every outer iteration or after each time step uh, enforces the actual contact angle we have the contact we have the point normals here at the contact line and this actually reorients itself to uh, to establish the contact angle here and from this we can also calculate the contact line speed uh, from the contact line uh, from the contact line normal which is the point normal here and the interface velocity uh, from the face adjoining here so uh, so with this i would i would like to come to the navier slip boundary condition which we have uh, which is which is which is as i said one of the methods to regularize mathematically the contact line motion and also in the simulations this is uh, very important as i will talk about in the next few slides uh, and uh, and this is how it looks like and and we have actually derived and implemented this uh, 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 in open form uh, and also the free free slip boundary condition for free surface flows so uh, just like to point out that this navier slip boundary condition is uh, it's quite important and it's been rigorously tested and the most uh, recent verification validation data is available here and this this work was done in the context of uh, in stationary channel flows with slip the simulations with navier slip were used to validate the analytical uh, analytical analytical algorithm or the solution framework uh, to obtain the uh, in stationary velocities in the channel flow with slip with uh, the equal and unequal slip 
and this is available here and all the test cases and the data are also publicly available. And I would also like to point out that the Navier slip boundary condition implemented here has been open source now uh, with some with the test case of 2D capillary rise running with Intertrack form, but it, it can run with any other solver. Uh, and this has been compiled and uh, put into the repository to work with ESI version of the open form right now. And I will be adding more test cases uh, in the coming weeks to this. So moving on from this to the classical capillary rise problem and uh, like how we how we investigate this here now. Uh, first, we have the we have the standard capillary rise with with H here being the urine site at stationary height balanced by the surface tension on the interface and gravity acting downwards. And we have this in, interface intersecting the uh, interface moving along the walls here uh, in 3D, it is the capillary in 2D is moving along the walls of the two parallel plates. And we have the angle at which the interface intersects, intersects the wall at which it is moving on the macroscopic scale, the macroscopic contact angle and the radius of the capillary. And the story begins here with, uh, with experiments done by K, uh, uh, where, where they studied experimentally the dynamics of the capillary rise before it reaches the urine site and they found that for certain fluid parameters there is there is certain oscillations and then it eventually uh, reaches the stationary height and, and they introduced the simplified model uh, based on this and it's it's a one dimensional balance of uh, these forces and they and they established the criterion uh, to, uh, criterion which takes the fluid parameters and tells us that at when when these oscillations occur and this has been universally established to be less than 2 uh, I would like to point out also that the omega which we saw previously didn't have any any information on the slip, and so we don't have information on the dissipation which is occurring at the contact lines, or 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 along the walls of the capillary. And in the previous works, uh, there there was some simulations done uh, comparing different numerical methods such as WOF, DG, and Intertrack form uh, to cross validate the numerical methods for 2D capillary rise. And it was seen that the Navier slip boundary condition is, is boundary condition is quite essential for the simulations to converge, and also an ODE model with uh, with dissipation in the contact lines was also derived from these uh, from from continuum equations and and in and two D simulations done in intertrack inter form to validate these ODE models here. Um, and one of the important point here is the slip length qualitatively changes the behavior of, behavior of capillary rise. Here we have for the blue curve uh, a slip length of one millimeter, and we see considerable oscillation here. And just cha just changing, decreasing it by order of ten, we have uh, we have a monotonic rise here. This is not accounted for in any ODE model. So and also these simulations were done with a static contact angle, and so a dynamic contact angle also would have certain influence on the characteristics of 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 the on the dynamics of the rise, and so we need now we need the Navier slip, uh, which accounts for the dissipation and the dynamic contact angle. And here I just want to reintroduce uh, reintroduce the ODE model with slip and just uh, highlight the important points as it as it was in the already previous shown previous publication there. And I want to point out that here the actual urine site is corrected with uh, corrected with the height coming from the mass of this region here and and this is not accounted for in the classical ODE model uh, and and the actual actual height in the capillary rise would be much smaller than the urine site and this 2D uh, 2D model with slip considers the viscous dissipation in the contact line and also and also uh, other influences mainly mainly also slip effect in the Poiseuille flow region uh, so two da one, two radius away from the interface, and this uh, this this equation, which accounts for the viscous dissipation, has been derived from the stream function solution in the wedge, uh, considering the Stokes flow here. And and I just want to highlight the important term in the ODE model here uh, for slip length very much smaller than the radius. This is the important term which accounts for the uh, dissipation in the in the wedge region here. And we also have some additional terms, uh, the head square terms, uh, which which can mean different things depending on the start point of the modeling, like the effect of reservoir or other effects. We, it's it's called the combined square term generally, and, and this h bar here 
accounts for accounts for how much of the wedge height is really important how much of it is contributing uh, to the dissipation here and so with this the important thing is that we saw an omega earlier and here we also have the same omega and also we have an additional non-dimensional slip parameter so we have two parameters that predict when oscillations occur with this ODE model and so uh, with this with this we see that for different values of the non-dimensional slip uh, we see different behavior uh, close uh, in this region in this specific region here we have a transition uh, transition in the in the rise and and there is a critical critical value of navier slip uh, which changes this behavior rapidly and this has been plotted for the for the classical data from kere also this analysis is pretty much close to the stationary height because we can actually see uh, see any non we can actually put away the nonlinear effects and actually see uh, what is going on in in this in this region here and looking closely at this region here we can actually identify uh, more precisely what is the non dimensional uh, critical value here uh, which which says it is a monotonic rise or it is an oscillatory rise and and we have a non dimensional uh, value of uh, value here and from this uh, that the obtained approximate uh, slip value is in the order of nanometer which is which is actually uh, supposed to be the quite realistic slip value in physical situations and so uh, here we have a direct comparison with the ODE and simulation these these are 2d simulations here uh, and we see that for very low slip values uh, the ODE and simulation take take in the same slip values but it's not true for the other cases and this is a question we are looking into as to why uh, but 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 this is what we want to see uh, a slip up uh, what we want to see like a a predict a, pred a prediction on the slip value to be used in the simulation from the ODE and also also input inputting a slip value into the ODE to to also predict experiments in the future and this is the story with the Navia slip and and we also have a ODE model with the dynamic contact angle this is the new analysis approach we have taken where we are introducing a linear friction model uh, for the dynamic contact angle here and we substitute this into the classical uh, model which we saw earlier and we again obtain with two parameters we recover the uh, standard omega and we have uh, analogous to the non-dimensional slip a non-dimensional friction parameter this is uh, the, this is the friction parameter in the um, in the dynamic contact angle model and this is to be determined somehow experiments theory molecular dynamics and and yeah so the the so the previous nonlinear equation it's 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 quite not clear how we can arrive at at a criteria for oscillation to be less than two and so we had to linearize the previous ode and and recast it into uh, an equation for the standard harmonic oscillator and and recover back the two parameters uh, which which definitely de definitively show that uh, it is less than two. The criteria for oscillation is less than two, and with without considering the dynamic contact angle, we we have the classical omega here. And so this this allows us to plot a regime map to predict for what values of uh, friction parameter uh, we and and for what value of omega we can have an oscillatory or monotonic regime. And 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 we see that for zero friction, uh, we recover the criteria that omega is equal to two here. And and when the non-dimensional parameter is quite large, uh, the critical omega is is very small. Uh, there is more friction in the system, and omega has to be much less than two uh, to transition into the oscillatory regime. And here we try to validate the ODE model by comparing it comparing it with experiments. And uh, uh, there is there is a little offset here, uh, but this ODE model, this ODE plot does not consider the meniscus mass. And and we and we see that varying the friction parameter, we again can uh, we again can uh, look at uh, different different curves from the ODE model, oscillatory or monotonic. And here we compare it, compare it with the most recent experimental data available, studying the dynamics in capillary rise, and uh, we have a good good agreement here. But this ODE model uh, 
needed a contact angle value a little bit different from the experiments and that's also that's also a current question as to why we are looking into so uh, <clears throat> comparing the ODE model with a dynamic contact angle to the simulations to the uh, to 2d simulations with intertrack foam and and here we we if we can fit a value for the friction parameter we can fit the ODE to the simulation and obtain a value for friction parameter uh, but this friction parameter exactly uh, what does it mean in in, in a physical context uh, is, a, is also a question right now it's largely a work in progress and so uh, what does it mean physically we are looking into and yeah so this is the uh, uh, so here we are up to the point of 2d simulations and ultimately we want to go to 3d simulations of this uh, of the capillary rise full dns uh, with navius with navius slip with high resolved meshes at the contact line uh, and uh, and we have this simulation capability within our framework of interface tracking and uh, we would like to go, go with this to the esi version of interface tracking just like to show the video of the full uh, video of the oscillatory rise um, And uh, yeah, nothing much visible in the in, in the three D perspective, but I couldn't capture the three D view uh, for the for the long rise. Uh, but yeah, it's the two D view of the three D simulations, and and we see the uh, oscillations. So yeah. So yeah, the, the, this is where we stand right now. The current challenge is to go to full 3D simulations uh, with Navia Slip and use our uh, existing contact angle library uh, with, with, within, within our uh, inter intertrack form and port, these, port those developments to uh, the intertrack form available in the easy version uh, uh, quite some time ago ported by Professor Tukovic. And, and what these lead us to is a 3D simulation with Navia slip with dynamic contact angle and, and a full uh, comparison with experiments. So, so here we, we really want to see what is the influence of Navia slip, what is the influence of the dynamic contact angle uh, in, in, in the dynamics of this rise and actually try to quantify, quantify the effects of these two. And as we saw, we have uh, we have an omega and we have a non-dimensional slip. We have an omega and we have a non-dimensional friction parameter. So we also wanted to establish a quantity relationship between the slip and the friction parameter. Uh, and and also ultimately, this work is leading to couple both the ODE models into one model, which will account for these two effects, and and go 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 into uh, prediction uh, prediction of going to pred predictive simulations. Can, so the ultimate question is, can we use this ODE, which, is, which has both these effects and use very small slip values, which we can't input to simulations and compare it with experiments. Yep, so much for it. Thank you very much. So we have now room for questions. Parts, please. So I have one question regarding slide six about your contact angle uh, and the mesh. I think it was slide six. Yeah, this one for the contact contact angle motion. I mean, can you explain why do you add the Navier slip equation? Is it because of your triple line, which is a bit uh, abrupt. Uh, why we have an yeah. Is it related to the contact line uh, geometry? Uh, no, actually. First, the Navier step is mathematically required uh, to regularize the contact line. Otherwise, the contact line is going to move. We have uh, Sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, because the audience cannot be understood. OK, thank you. Uh, so we need the Navier slip. Uh, to regularize the motion in, in the sense that mathematically the contact line won't move. There is like an infinite, inf infinite uh, friction force uh, uh, 
not allowing the contact line to move. So, so Navia step is one of the ways. There is also generalized Navia boundary condition, and 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 I'm not sure of the other regularization methods, but but yeah, uh, in terms of simulations, uh, we can of course do this without Navier slip. There is a numerical slip where the where the velocity uh, velocity on this space here is directly used here. So so the simulations do do run, but they never converge, and that's what we uh, showed it showed in the publications uh, in the next slides. So so the Navier slip uh, changes the dynamics, and also it's required for the simulations to converge. Yeah, you have no problem of uh, divergence at the trapper line. You know we are uh, on the substrate uh, no. because sometimes you know in the literature they had they say that the contact line is not uh, spherical, and they had a small meniscus at the triple line to be sure that it's continuous. So if I understood the question, uh, do we have divergence there? And uh, uh, no, actually, I haven't uh, found any problems regarding divergence, uh, divergence of any velocity or anything there. Uh, We have also a question from the audience online. Can you please? Yes, I just I just wanted to comment on this. Uh, so I'm the I'm also involved in this project as the project leader. And um, regarding the last question, indeed, what you will find is a weak singularity in the pressure field as you refine. So we expect a logarithmic divergence of the pressure. But still, the dynamics converges if the slip length that we impose, if it's resolved by the mesh. So this is the important point here. Thank you, Matthias, for the clarification. Any other questions? Yeah, we have another one here. Yes. Thank you. So. Uh, I a short question. I was wondering in the last part of your um, of your presentation, you showed uh, experiments and or theory and compared theory with your simulations, mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed the convergence with the largest slip length is the best. Uh, can the smallest slip length is the best? Okay, okay. So so no slip is the best. Uh, a smaller kind of slip. Uh, need to have slip. Yeah, we need to have have slip, and and with smaller value of slip, we have good agreement. But with larger value, uh, there is we we still don't know why it's diverging. We have to look into the ODE model once again. Okay, so thank you. Let's thank the speaker once again. So the next presenter in this session is Francisco Bobziani. <laughs> And uh, his presentation is a, an hybrid atomistic continuum approach for co-simulation of multi-scale wetting processes. Please, Francisco. Just hold on. Yeah, ask you. How is it being shared? Can everyone hear me? Is it being shared um, on both uh, online and offline? Can anyone from the offline audience, uh, from the online audience, also confirm it's being shared? Yeah, it's yes, Thank you. Okay, so can I start? Please, please. Okay, uh, just is this working? It's, it doesn't change the slides. Okay, but it can. Okay, okay, this is fine. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, turning into my uh, presentation. I'm Francisco Pozioni. I'm a PhD student from Holger Marshall's group in Darmstadt, and uh, in them I'm here to to talk to you about. Uh, my current work in, in, in hyperatomistic continuum uh, simulations for co simulation of uh, wetting phenomena. Here are all of the people involved. So, uh, so 
Hal Hardy, uh, who is working also with us, and Edward Smith from Imperial, Imperial College London, who is the developer of a very sort of useful tool to couple both solvers. So, so uh, first of all, as you have, I think, all seen, uh, wetting so uh, uh, sorry, any form of wetting simulation is very, is very hard to model accurately. It involves large scales in space and also time. So, for example, if I have a, a macro scale dro uh, droplet, I have a phenomena happening in both the uh, bulk region, but also an, at the contact line region. And especially at this contact line region, the scales involved are, uh, an, an, are a nanoscopic, basically. It's, it involves the motion of um, molecules and particles which interact with a sort of wall region. And this is what uh, we are trying to model in CFD. Uh, in my opinion, CFD uh, simulations are incapable as, as final as, as fine, sorry, uh, for a fine mesh as fine as you want, we are in, incapable of fully, fully sort of resolving these um, phenomena, this sort of, um, uh, of nanoscale uh, phenomena. And if we go and to the other side and just do a pure atomistic simulation, it, 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 it's it, sorry, it sort of requires too large of atoms and too large of a domain to compute anything in a sort of useful time. But why not combine both sort of solvers into a single one? And we have basically a sort of a union of both advantages of CFD and atomistic solvers into a single one. So, so, so uh, basically, as you can see here, we have um, a, sim a simple, a simple droplet. Where is the? Uh, this is fine. I have a, I have a simple droplet, and I have two solvers now. who are talking to each other. Uh, and in the continuum solver, I have my uh, uh, CFD solver from open foam, and the atomistic solver. I have my atomistic solver. Yeah, the lamp solver or so on. And I have a control. Sort of region uh, to talk that talks with each solver basically that has a, a sort of an input or a, the or sorry where the exchange of information from each solver is happening. So the idea is to bridge the caps in both solvers by using this sort of approach. Our sort of idea is to use for the continuum solver uh, the diffuse interface phase field model. Uh, for the molecular solvers, our idea is to use molecular dynamics, uh, especially uh, uh, some sort of Lennard Jones fluids, which are the simplest one to uh, um, model from atomistic solvers. And, and we want to use uh, exchanger or some sort of interface that talks, that like allows the communication from solver to solver. You may be asking why I'm, I'm saying a class one, the diffuse interface phase field model. Well, it's for two reasons. The first one is that our group already has a T solver, so it's just convenient. And also, if you have a look at the interface profile, where I, maybe can I have a pointer? Yeah. Of the atomistic scales, the interface profile has the same shape as the phase field uh, um, model interfaces, for example. So, so why not sort of um, a sort of make use of this um, similarity and just use this solver for our atomistic simulations. Yeah, so currently as of now, the state of the art is just, you either do, do a fully atomistic solver and a fully uh, CFD uh, solver simulations, and you compare and see if, if the results match and you get some paper out of this or some information out of this, or you use the, the atomistic solvers to either get uh, parameters for your um, continuum sort of models, or you either use this as like initialization states for your continuum simulations. Just a quick note, uh, aside from MD simulations, you also have the um, Monte Carlo solvers, but it's mainly being used for verified gas models. And if you have complex or more complex structures or um, uh, uh, molecules 
MC solvers are not very good at um, as, as, as MD solvers. Our idea then is to do really a co-simulation co uh, via a hybrid atomistic continuum approach, where our idea is to use an equation of states that we get from the atomistic solvers and use this into our uh, CTFD solver at runtime. And we also want to use uh, some averaging schemes to couple both solvers. And that way, we are able to reproduce the interfacial sort of nuances of, of, the, of, of such a, a phenomena that the pure CFD, that the pure CFD solver is unable to, uh, to do. So how is it done? We basically uh, uh, sort of decompose our domain into three parts. The, the continuum solver domain for our, our CFD simulations, the atomic solver domain, and this uh, overlapping region. In this like overlapping region, it's the most important part of in, 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 in this work. Why? It's in each region where it's in this region where the uh, every exchange of information from both the atomistic solver and the continuum solver will happen. And this is also, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's 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 the it's the, it's the most important part of the of the coupling aspect. Um, uh, for us, we are using a crystal foam solver, which is our in-house solver. Uh, for DMD, we are using a uh, sort of lamps because it's 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 open source, it's widely uh, documented, and also very well uh, validated. And for the and for the coupling, we are using uh, the CPL library. CPL library has been uh, 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 developed by Edward Smith, who is also a sort of helping us in um, in some sort of exchange of information, also with him and to uh, go further with the sort of library, and it allows for the or in, and it allows for the coupling with the two solvers. So, how do we want to uh, go for this? So, here is the current sort of workflow we have. We have a mesh generation. We have the uh, pimple loop. Uh, if if the solver is non isothermal, is non isothermal, we have an energy equation as well. We solve the equations for the MD, and in in each MD uh, uh, in each MD time step, we sample our system, and we use this as uh, as sort of an input for the boundary conditions uh, of our uh, CFD solver. Why why for the boundary conditions? Contact line uh, sort of region or wall modeling is the uh, trickiest part in in our work for wetting simulation. So the idea here is to use really the full atomistic solver only near the uh, contact line area or, or region. So here are the uh, sort of leveraging equations here on the left hand side or, or yeah on the left hand side. Uh, here are all the uh, the uh, uh, sort of leveraging schemes for both the velocity coupling and also for the uh, temperature coupling. And here is how, how we actually um, uh, plan on changing our phase field uh, model to use this, um, this, this, this function. So as of now, phase field models suffer from using a, a purely uh, phenomenological function in, in, in here for this Psi of C. Our idea is to uh, uh, go away from this and only use the inputs or the sort of results from the MD simulation. And after this, our atomistic solver, as I said, is currently sort of living uh, in the areas of interest as a type one boundary condition. So here is the first, uh, keep in mind, uh, this work has only been started four or five months ago. We have not been able yet to go for a fully uh, coupled uh, simulation with a, 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 a starting droplet for, uh, for now. But we have been able to uh, uh, couple this with Icofoam, the most simple solver one can use. And we are using a sort of lamps to do the 
atomistic solver, as I, as I said. So here is the uh, sort of lamps domain, and, the, and for the wireframe, it's the icophone domain, and here is our overlapping region. Each cell in, in each cell of the um, of the uh, in our view, or sorry, each cell of our um, CFD mesh, we have an, an uh, uh, sorry, we have a cell we have a cell by cell averaging scheme happening uh, where, for example, if I have a hundred cells in uh, hundred uh, particles in a cell, this the the, uh, the the velocity vector and the pressure of each uh, of, of those particles are sort of averaged and serve as an input for this uh, cell. So here is the coupling. It, it, it hasn't seen as much as going on, but uh, currently we are exchanging the inf information for, uh, from the MD and for the CFD domain at, at, at the same time. So what is going on actually is we sort of initialize the uh, atomistic at at simulations. We, we sort of let it equilibrate to a, um, uh, how to say, equilibrium condition somewhat. Then it, then this serves as sort of an input for the, uh, uh, for the Icofoam solver. It runs a CFD time step, and afterwards it, it will run more MD time steps and so on and so forth, always serving as an input for uh, one another. For next steps, our idea is to extend this to a uh, two-phase flow. Our idea is to exchange information as well. So as of now, we are exchanging only the uh, velocity factors and the pressure components. Our idea is to also exchange now, for example, the volume fraction and the uh, viscosity. Of, of and and also the density of, of both um, both phases uh, from the MD to the uh, FD part and vice versa and we also want to couple this with our uh, form solver and also do this um, uh, simulation so here it's only sort of MD and our idea is to really run uh, a fully coupled quad flow for uh, to liquid system. Um, as of now, we are in close uh, collaboration with Edward Smith, and I will now thank him. He's been very helpful in um, uh, sort of helping us understand the library, and also it's been very uh, sort of a for discussion. And our idea is to really go further with uh, Facefield Hack Foam, where we can really have these uh, coupled, coupled solvers going on. Thank you very much. It's all from my side. I, I hope you have uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Very nice, very nice work. Congratulations. Uh, so, questions for Francisco. Uh, very nice work. Uh, I have a question about, I, I think I didn't understand uh, what uh, you, uh, if you have used the, the Monte Carlo uh, method. Okay, okay. So, so we, we have tools for uh, by GPS simulations, but... Uh, no, 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 no worries. So no, um, actually it has been coupled already uh, some, it also some other solvers, but it's mainly for uh, edified gas simulations and actually for more complex uh, sort of molecules. Um, Monte Carlo is not really suitable to, um, to run these sort of simulations. Also, as far as I'm aware, and these simulations are easier to, uh, to parallelize. So that's why we are going towards the sort of lamp side and, and the MD side of solvers for atomistic solvers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, any other questions for Francisco? Maybe Francisco, I can, can have one. Regarding the, the boundary conditions for the continuous uh, yeah. uh, modeling, 
uh, what are you imposing for, because you need for pressure for velocity yeah is is a kind of uh, it's mostly boundary, boundary it's, uh, it's really a, a quiet flow so, so uh, on the boundary. sorry okay yeah it's a quiet flow so at 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 a boundary patch i have i have a, a zero uh, zero uh, velocity boundary condition it's, it's it's fixed value but this is overwritten by the md simulation input basically so yeah. So so then then at uh, after getting the information from the MD simulations, you impose uh, 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 sleep velocity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It comes from the MD side basically. Yeah. So. Perfect. More thank you. realistic, I would say. So. Let's see. Ah, so yeah. Marcus. Yeah, please. Yes, so Francesco, thank you very much for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I was just wondering, um, I mean, the, the MD and the continuum, they live on very different scales, not only in terms of space, but also in terms of time. So um, I could imagine that the MD response, it looks like instant from the continuum uh, perspective. Does this pose any issues? Uh, sorry. Uh, actually, uh, we run so. A uh, good question. At first, of course, I'm not running an MD simulation for some seconds or so on. It will take too long of a time. What we do is just we first uh, start the atomistic solver. It it will go to a, a, a equilibrium state, right? Mm -hmm. It will transfer the uh, information to, into to the CFD solver. This, 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 sorry, the CFD solver is running its time step. After this is over, it will exchange this, this information as an input for the MD solver, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the MD solver will run again up and for some time steps to reach again the equilibrium states. Okay, so, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you kind in, of. So, in, in, in a sense, it's not really. Fully coupled. If it was fully coupled, I would have the same time, right? Time scale for for both solvers. But it's, uh, I would say, it's. Uh, it's impossible, probably. Yeah, it is impossible. So it's good enough. I, uh, yeah, I would say it's good enough. This is. Uh, does this answer your your question or? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Matus. Cool. So if there are no more questions for Francisco, let's, let's thank him once again. So uh, thank you, Miguel, for the kind introduction. And I am uh, David Barreiro. I am a PhD student from University of A Coruña and collaborative PhD at the, at the Bon Carman Institute. And in today's talk, I will present some of the results um, we have been uh, obtaining uh, about the, the jet wiping process of high capizza liquid films. So let's start by introducing what is jet wiping. We are mainly focused on hot dip galvanization. So we have a steel strip that dips in a coating bath with molten zinc, dragging a coating layer on its surface due to viscosity. And then we apply a gas jet uh, perpendicular to the liquid film to control the thickness of the, of the coating layer, reaching around five to 10 microns uh, uh, in, the, in the final coating. Here is a sketch of the process where you can see the gas jet impinging on the liquid film and developing two different regions. One uh, is the final coating film, which corresponds to the final product. And the other one is the runback flow in which part of the flow is going upwards due to viscous drag of the plate. And then uh, the excess of thickness removed by the gas jet is going down because of the, uh, uh, of the action of the gas jet. So, this is the most widely used technique uh, in galvanization because it is uh, energy efficient and it is contactless, so uh, the, the cost is uh, lower than other alternatives, such as electromagnetic uh, actuators. And also because uh, there are simplified models that allow for playing with the, with the parameters of the, of the galvanization line to get a specific uh, final coating uh, thickness. The main drawback is that due to the unsteady interaction between the impinging gas jet and the liquid film, 
uh, the final product is printed with some uh, non-uniformities, which uh, we refer to as undulations. Here you can see an animation of great impact uh, for quality standards. So in my PhD project, we analyze what is the mechanism, the hydrodynamic mechanism that, is, that leads to, the, to these undulations. And also we explore different numerical uh, models to, to, to tackle the problem. In a previous step of the, of the project, we have uh, been uh, um, performing high fidelity simulations with open foam that combine uh, volume of fluid and larger dissimulation. Here you can see some animations. And uh, we, we validated the, the results with uh, some experimental data of the same conditions. It is important to know that this are not, uh, the, is not the industrial case, but it's a, a case that has been uh, uh, very well documented uh, with experiments. We also applied uh, multi-scale model analysis to try to understand uh, the mechanism of undulation. So here I summarize the, the, the main results. We, we have found that the undulations were mostly two-dimensional and uh, emerging in, uh, where the jet impedes the, the liquid film and then travel downstream in both directions. And that was coupled with some uh, side jet uh, deformation due to the uh, passage of the, of the waves in the ramac flow. We could also link that to a certain uh, perturbation of the wiping actuators. The wiping actuators are the pressure gradient and shear stresses at the interface. And uh, they describe the momentum transfer between the gas jet and the liquid film. So we have seen that the, the undulations are mostly produced by a uh, pulsation com combined also with an oscillation of the, of the wiping actuators, especially here in the, in the runback flow where we have these big waves. But the second part of the title says uh, high capita liquid film. So why high capita liquid films? The interest of that is that the, the pre these previous experiments were conducted with dipropylene glycol, where as, as shown here um, in a comparison with the industrial case with, uh, with zinc, here you can see the, the most important dimensions less numbers for the liquid film and for the cassette. So the thing is that dipropylene glycol is not, the, the wiping of dipropylene glycol is not representative of the industrial case. So, uh, we, we had to design a new test case. In this case, we, we used uh, water where we can reach better similarity of the flow without uh, um, simulating the industrial case because uh, no one could uh, ever simulate the industrial case. Uh, so we, you can see here that in terms of Reynolds number and capillary and capizza number, we are much closer to the industrial case than uh, the simulations with ipropylene glycol. The thing is that we couldn't, we, we, we should not extrapolate the results with the propylene glycol to, to what happens in industry without doing this kind of uh, tests. So in this presentation, I will try to address these two questions. The first one is that um, how the mechanism changes when, when, we, uh, when we change from uh, the propylene glycol to, to water. So that for, to answer this question, we will use uh, high fidelity CFD uh, uh, simulations and we will use uh, also model analysis to, to try to uh, describe the mechanism. And then the other one is, uh, is it possible to use uh, simplified models, uh, integral models to, to simulate jet wiping because uh, these high fidelity simulations are very costly and cannot be applied in, in industry. So let's start by answer, answering the, the first question. As I said, the, the high fidelity model combines uh, BOF and LES. This is the fourth presentation of the fifth uh, session on multiphase flow. So I, I hope you, you all know uh, Interform and volume of fluid. So we, in Interform, we have an algebraic uh, formulation of, of, of um, the transport equation of alpha. And um, we also introduce an interface compression term to avoid the, the smearing of the interface. This is the, um, we, we use this Magoninsky model for the, for the LES. And this is the numerical domain for the simulations where we have the coating bud, the, the steel strip, 
and then uh, some atmospheric boundary conditions, the external uh, geometry of the gas jet, and then the inlet where we establish the, the gas flow. Just to, um, to, to, to make sure that all people will follow the, the post-processing, I, I wanted to summarize more or less the, the, um, the model analysis techniques. It could be used for several, uh, uh, for several um, objectives in fluid mechanics, but here we, we focus mostly on filtering and pattern recognition. So the idea is that uh, your uh, um, original data um, organized in this matrix in space and time could be represented as a linear combination of modes and each of these modes have a spatial structure which will give us the information about how energy is uh, distributed in space. But in this case, uh, this is a thickness uh, distribution. It will tell us how, how the undulations look like for that mode. Then we have the temporal structure, which will tell us how the spatial structures evolve in time. And then we will have the amplitude, which uh, gives us information about how dominant is that mode, or which is the same, how dominant is that uh, pattern in our or original data. Here you can see some uh, results of uh, the simulations with water where we have the gas jet impinging on a liquid film and uh, developing very beautiful, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> patterns in the, in the runback flow. And uh, the undulations cannot be seen here because of the scales, but uh, you, you will see them uh, in uh, following slides. And here I just want to represent the differences between uh, the simulations of deep propylene glycol and uh, with water. Because here you can already see that the, the flow is not similar to, to the water because uh, the runback flow, it's, uh, the, the regime of the runback flow is completely different because it's, it's not fully established. In red, there is the part of the flow that is going upwards and uh, in green, the part of the flow that is going downwards. So, we can see that uh, the runback flow is uh, kind of really unsteady and really slow with big waves uh, uh, going down. But with water, we have one layer that is going upwards because of the viscous drag, and then the other layer of uh, the, the flow that is going, going down. So the, the kinematics of the film are completely different. And here I summarize the results of the model analysis. These are the most dominant modes in the film. And uh, we still see that uh, the main uh, patterns are two dimensional of a frequency of uh, around uh, 100, 200 Hertz. This is very interesting because uh, a gas jet impinging on a dry flat plate, the natural frequency of the jet is around uh, 10 kilohertz. So it means that this is a, the, the, the footprint of a coupling mechanism because otherwise we, we would have very high frequencies in the film. But in this case, the, the film is uh, acting as a low pass filter, let's say. And here you can see a, re a reconstruction of the film. This is our original data. And this is the uh, low order reconstruction using only a couple, uh, two modes in which we, we, we can see that uh, we can capture a lot of the dynamics of the flow with uh, just uh, two modes. If we do the same for the gas jet, here, is, uh, here are the results for dipropylene glycol. Uh, you can see this is the fluctuating part of the velocity field, the already reconstructed from the two most dominant uh, modes. And uh, in dipropylene glycol, the main pattern was a kind of vortex shedding of the, of, in the gas jet uh, in close interaction with the runback flow, which correspond to, to, the, to this uh, side jet deformation. But when we look at the water, the, the main pattern is this, uh, this structure here in the core of the jet, which uh, represents um, uh, the oscillation of the tip of the jet, as you can see here in the reconstruction. So this means that uh, the, the kinematics, again, are uh, very different. Also, it is very interesting to see here that the liquid film is very, very much less uh, intrusive to the gas jet than in the case with the propylene glycol. 
going to the to to how the kinematics uh, translate to to the forces and the, the momentum transfer between the cassette and the and the film you can see that uh, the uh, with the propylene glycol we had this uh, this pulsation plus oscillation and uh, here with water we kind of see the same mechanism although at a higher frequency because uh, as you as you could see here the the scales in the in the film are much uh, much faster than in the in the, in the propylene glycol where these waves were creating in a very periodical wave way very very slow so here you can see also the um, uh, the evolution in time and space but uh, uh, it's more or less the same conclusion and then the other the, the other uh, question was to um, regarding the validation of integral models for for jet wiping so we take the data we we have obtained uh, from the cfd simulations and we will compare this data with an integral model so we we use as an input the data from the cfd simulations we use the thickness uh, flow rates in uh, extreme wise and span wise directions and so we will compare uh, the results in this domain uh, which um, corresponds to the to the final coating we also introduce the um, the pressure gradients and shear stress from the cfd here i summarize the the fundamentals of the integral uh, model which is based on the long wavelength approximation, which allows for reformulating the problem uh, from the navier stokes equations to uh, these equations. This is the 2D formulation as a function of the dimensionsless uh, thickness and the dimensionsless uh, flow rate. So the key simplifications are the long wavelength approximation, the one way coupling. So we, are, we assume that the, the jet is not affected by the film, which is uh, a strong assumption because we have seen that, uh, in fact, this is what is uh, creating the, the undulations, and then the self-similarity of the velocity profiles. This is the formulation in 3D, but uh, what I want to highlight here with these uh, yellow boxes are the, the data that we, we introduced from OpenFOAM to, to this integral, uh, to this integral uh, model. We do not uh, take into account surface tension because of uh, because uh, it introduces some uh, uh, numerical instabilities that uh, we are still uh, looking at them. And uh, finally, this is the um, comparison between open form and blue and, and the, the integral model. So you can, uh, you can see that the, the, the results uh, of the integral model are very good compared to, to open form. They, they match very well except uh, far downstream where but uh, here i would blame more open form because uh, we could not have very good meshes far downstream so numerical diffusion was uh, artificially damping the the undulations so just to conclude for the first uh, question um, we have compared the the, the, the mechanism with the deep propylene glycol and water and we have seen that the kinematics are different uh, here I summarized uh, the main conclusions, but the, in terms of forces and uh, momentum transfers between, uh, between phases, the behavior is quite uh, similar, uh, except for the, uh, let's say, spatial and temporal scales, which are faster in uh, water than in the propylene glycol. And we also validated the, 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 um, the integral formulation for, for its application in jet wiping, which opens many uh, paths for research for uh, uh, could be for flow control uh, to, to to train algorithms for for flow control or to implement this on uh, on industrial lines and just to conclude in terms of the project we have seen that the high fidelity simulations are very good we we can have realistic data and um, we we can capture all the physics but the computational cost is very high and we have we we can have numerical problems at the interface like uh, treatment of, of turbulence or parasitic currents etc and on the other hand the low fidelity model is represents well the dynamics of the film it is cheap to run uh, but the thing is that the quality of the results depend on the on the quality of the inputs so the idea for the future work is 
what if we combine the best of the two worlds? So um, the idea we, we want to implement in the future is a single phase solver for the gas jet, as the one you, you can see here, uh, where we can um, compute the stresses here at, uh, in fact, this should be a wall. And uh, we pass the information of the stresses to the integral model, which is accurate to represent the dynamics. And uh, we feed again the single phase solver with the new deformation predicted by the simplified model to deform the mesh again. And uh, we, we hope this, this will work uh, very well and could be uh, a promising, we think it could be a promising uh, tool for, for the future. And this is everything. Thank you for your attention. And now I would be happy to, to take your questions. Thank you. Very good work. Nice presentation. So we have already a question from the audience. Hi. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, for nice work. I have, a, I have a question about your mesh. How fine is your mesh? I would, I would sort of imagine if you have a not that sharp of a mesh, you wouldn't have, uh, uh, capture the waves very well, I assume, right? Sure, sure. I skip that part. If you want to pass in the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, here you can see a sketch and a snapshot of the mesh. It was very painful to because we did it in uh, block mesh. It was very difficult to find a compromise because there are a lot of scales that you have to respect for the gas jet, for the liquid, uh, the interface, etc. Also the aspect ratios. So um, in in total, it was uh, I think it was uh, 14 million cells. Uh, since it is 3D and uh, very quickly you reach a very high number of cells. But uh, yeah, it was very difficult to find a compromise between the cost, accuracy, and uh, so on. But uh, to to have an idea, the 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 meshes, the cell size in the inside the the, the final film, it was uh, two microns. So mm. thank you. Thank you. Okay. So any other questions? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, in the beginning of your uh, presentation, you mentioned that uh, it's not really possible to um, simulate the industrial case, and that's why you went with water. Uh, I'm not really sure I understood exactly why it's not uh, possible to do the industrial case. Yes, so um, only uh, the, the people from uh, Professor Saleski, they, they tried with the Basilisk code. I, I don't know if you know that. Uh, they, they tried, but the, they, they just uh, did very few um, simulations of the first uh, moments when the gas jet impinges the, the film. And so they were looking at the splashing, which is uh, when, when the film breaks up in, uh, in droplets. And um, the, the, the thing is that uh, also in the industrial case, the, the Reynolds number are very high. So when you have to resolve very well the jet, also the liquid and so on, uh, the, the computational cost is, is very high. I remember, I, more or less, I remember that, uh, in fact, they, they didn't, um, the, 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 the part of the gas jet was not very well resolved, as far as I know, but they, they had very good uh, adapt adaptative uh, mesh refinement at the interface to, to capture that. But I think they, they must um, lose some of the physics because of that. Uh, there is always the compromise. So we think that with uh, the, the hybrid model that we are proposing, we, we can get rid of all the scales uh, from the liquid that we have to respect to, to have good definition of the interface because in fact, the, the interface will become uh, a wall. And so we, we, we think that this could be a nice alternative to, to be able to simulate the, the industrial case. I hope uh, I answered your question. Thank you. Any other questions for David? So if not, I don't know. 
Let's check online. No. Isn't it's it? yeah. <laughs> no way. Okay. Time to go. So <laughs> let's thank David once again. Thank you.